with Leaders Edge where learning is a never ending journey limitless business. Good day everyone. Welcome to the Leaders Edge. Today it's season 9 episode 10 and we have a unique guest. Unique in that he volunteered to be on our show, which is a wonderful thing because normally when you volunteer, that means you have such a powerful message you want to share. And ladies and gentlemen, this is something you would like to hear. Why? Because Paul Angelo Verona Lazo will be talking about beyond leadership competencies. So why don't we allow Paul to introduce himself? Paul, welcome to the virtual stage. Thank you, Dino, and hello, everyone. I'm pretty sure most of you will be saying, are you from the Philippines? Yes, I am. Then why do you look and sound like that? Well, I was a very fortunate young child. I left here when I was two years old, and I went to Italy. And I spent the next 15 years there. So that means I speak fluent Italian. And my dad, being with FAO, which is one of the groups under the UN umbrella, we were privileged but not rich, so I had the opportunity to be educated in an American IELTS, K-12. That's why I sound like this. Why do I look like this? Well, I don't know. My dad, half of him is American Spanish, pure. My mother has Indian blood, Asian Indian blood. And they say my last name, Lasso, is Chinese. They say it's Lao Tzu. So you put it all together and I look like somebody from the Middle East. It makes sense. Hmm. Well, that's wonderful because it means you have so much of you that it's pretty much like the United Nations in, in one body. You can say that. I was maybe a, an early example of a global citizen mm -hmm. because part of the privileges of UN is they give you a free trip home. So every other year, the whole family would be on an airplane between Rome and Manila. And in the 70s, that was a, you know, you're rich. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But we had the opportunity to visit practically every country in between, wow. at least by for a day or two, and it, it definitely shapes your your upbringing. Mm -hmm. Plus, in my school, half of my classmates were, for lack of a better word, a bunch of cowboys, and mm -hmm. the other half were the United Nations. Okay, I had the Brazilian, I had an Egyptian, I had a Lebanese, I had an Irish guy, I had all kinds of nationalities growing up with them. So I had that good fortune. It was really yeah. a privilege in that sense. Well, I envy you that. It sounds like there wasn't a dull moment. And <laughs> I, I have a feeling that when you get together and, and, and say have a few drinks, that it's really a very enjoyable experience. Uh, Ooh, yep. I, <laughs> so going to our topic today, Paul, I was wondering, uh, how did you get involved in leadership training? I'll pedal back a little bit so you understand where I'm coming from because it's not just the leadership training. It's pretty much, as you mentioned, it's the whole package. Yeah. I started working in 1985. Now, I'm pretty sure many of the viewers here weren't probably even born. And that means I've been working for almost how many years? I don't know. My, I stopped counting. But during that period, I had the opportunity to be CEO of two small companies. Okay. So I've been to the top and I've been to the bottom. I've fired people for all the right reasons. I've fired people for all the wrong reasons. And I've been fired for all the right reasons and all the wrong reasons too. So in short, I've been there. I've practically seen all of it. Mm. And most interesting of all, and I would like to say that this is probably my biggest virtue, which is patience. I have four daughters. So how many women do I live with? Five. <laughs> <laughs> that was raising them. Oh, okay. I was already 30. So I literally raised four kids. So it was, a, it was an interesting period in my life. Mm. But you put those all together and you put that tied up with my latest experience as a trainer where I was engaged with companies of all sizes, multinationals, big, small. And I, I would put in about a thousand hours of training every year. Mm. And I was working usually the upper management simply because of the way I looked. But I also covered technical courses such as project management, problem solving, decision making. And I did all the coaching courses, all the different levels of, of leadership, if you want to say. So pretty much that's what I bring. Now, as a trainer, I can't say I started off as a trainer. I was very operations based. 
And sometime in the middle of 2000, one of my clients, an American fellow, I was working at the call center then. He watched me working with my team. And he goes, you know, Paul, the way you talk, you can make a lot of money in the U.S. And that's when I began thinking. I said, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. I said, operation sounded interesting, but operations is very difficult from those of you who know it. And I said, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. So I made an effort to step into training. And that's where I started my journey as a trainer. Mm-hmm. In 2014, I joined probably the largest training group here in the Philippines. And that's where I started my 1,000 hours a year. Mm-hmm. And I was working with the leadership and management team. In the process, I also developed the emotional intelligence courses and delivered practically all of them. And I was usually working with the higher levels of management, the director. And that's what I bring. And as a trainer, it was that one moment where the guy told me, Paul, <laughs> the way you speak, you can make money in the U.S. I started thinking, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. So I decided to go into training. And training, I found out, is something that I really, really enjoy. If I were rich enough, I'd probably do it for free. But I'm not rich enough. <laughs> I understand. There's such fulfillment when you see changed lives, especially when you help an organization get beyond their problems and you can watch them grow and succeed and take some credit for that so it's always a nice feeling to be able to change lives so paul since you did mention that you went into training and then uh, specializing in helping leaders become better how critical are competencies as far as leadership goes Today, leadership is mainly understood as competencies. Now, when I speak of competencies, I speak of things like being able to empower, coaching, and anyone who's been to a leadership seminar or has actually trained leadership knows them. Mm -hmm. There are also the behavioral competencies, things like integrity, things like humility, things like compassion, all of these. But it's always the same thing. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong. Hmm. Companies and organizations still need it. They have to go to that kind of training. But after you've trained it so many times, you begin to start thinking, is there something deeper? Hmm. Is there something deeper? And that's when the thought of capacity came to my mind. Okay. And, And so you're saying that's when you began to look beyond competencies. Yes. Yes. That's when I began thinking about it. And it actually happened during COVID because I had a lot of time to think, like most of us. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Right? So you're stuck at home doing nothing. But then you started thinking. And first of all, let's distinguish between uh, competency and a capacity. Maybe a simple analogy is if we look at a thermometer, the the competency of the thermometer is to measure the temperature. Right. How accurately it measures the temperature maybe means it's a good thermometer if you want to call it. But its competency is its limit. So let's say the limit of the thermometer is, let's say, 400 degrees centigrade. Mm. Now, the thermometer works fine within that span. But if I put it in an environment of 600 degrees centigrade, what's going to happen to the thermometer? Mm. It doesn't work anymore. It'll probably right. blow up. But you certainly know it doesn't work. And pretty much... That's what happened during COVID. Mm. If you think about it, everything you knew wasn't there anymore. Right. I had a very interesting conversation with one of the senior leadership leaders in another company about it. And she was saying, how come we can't make a sale? Mm. And she goes, the data is showing that for every 10 inquiries that we get, we should be able to close three. Mm. And then she continues, given the situation, you know, even if you take three out, even if you made it 20, why can't we even close one? Right. But then I looked at her and said, no, you've got this, uh, there's something that isn't right here. You are looking at an environment, data gathered from an environment that doesn't exist anymore. Hmm. So you cannot use that. It's just no good. And then she suddenly became quiet. Pretty much, that's the thermometer going from 400 to 600. Mm -hmm. The environment is not there anymore. So you have to be able to look further than competencies. I'm not saying competencies competencies are not valid anymore. They are. Mm -hmm. They still are. They'll always be there, and they have to be trained, if you want to say. 
Mm. But we have to want, I want us to look a little further. So if I get it, if I get it right, you're saying that the, the pandemic was essentially when you began to start thinking about capacity. Exactly. Mm. And, and considering that uh, capacities are critical now because a lot of people initially had difficulty pivoting from analog to digital, managing teams remotely rather than managing them live. Uh, could you share for us some of the capacities that you found were critical, especially during the pandemic? So far, I've identified three. For me, it is like a theory I'm still working on, okay, but it, it seems to be pointed in the right direction. The first one, and this might sound very basic, but I'm sure you can easily relate. Can you distinguish between fact and fiction? Okay. Very first, very basic, but it's a must. Yeah. Now, a lot of people will say point to the science and all of this, and I'll agree point to the science. But it's not so much the science that we're pointing at. It should, it's the scientific method that you have to maintain. Mm -hmm. When a scientist publishes a paper, he will do 20 years of research, research 1,100 uh, how do you say, writings or manuscripts on the subject, that's what he'll review. Mm -hmm. And then he'll even post it to, be have, to have a peer review. And then everybody will have an opportunity to disagree and all of that. That's the scientific process you have to follow. Not, you know, just reading one article in Facebook and saying, oh gosh, this must be true. And then I'm going to follow this. I said, hey, hold on. Are you sure? Now, this is just a simple case with Facebook, but I think, especially among trainers, how many of you have managers that insist on unrealistic goals? Mm. How many? And they'll keep on pushing it. Yeah. For a reason you don't know, even though the data is pointing somewhere else, they'll still insist. Mm. Okay, so even it happens in simple things like that, mm. where, you know, you look at, is he actually looking at the data about what's going on? Mm. So first and foremost, you have to be able to dis distinguish between fact and fiction. Mm. That's a tricky one. It might look easy, but it's tricky, especially today with all the information that's available. You get confused yourself because <laughs> just everything's floating around. The other one is, and this one is a word I invented. I put two words together. I'm sure many of us are familiar with the efforts for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, or DEI for short, mm -hmm. but let's put it in terms of intellectual. When I say intellectual, can you be intellectually inclusive? Mm. When I say, can you be intellectually inclusive? Can you hold two, three, or four ideas that seem opposite in mm. your mind and be comfortable with it? Again, this is a little tricky, okay? I'm sure a number of us have seen those pictures where they show one figure where if you turn it one way, it looks like a square. You turn it the other way, it looks like a triangle or a circle. And the whole point there isn't that they're different perspectives. The whole point is the reality is there is that object that is a square, a triangle. It's all of it at one time. Are you comfortable with that? Mm. So in other words, uh, the shape changes depending on your perspective and to use that analogy you're saying that an event or a situation can look totally different depending on how you look at it and who you who, who you talk to absolutely but more importantly can you hold all of them in your in your brain mm. and not feel that there's something wrong they're all correct not oh this one has to be correct because this one has to be correct. No, they're all correct you know you're right because one of the hot button topics these days appear to be gender correctness. Um, on the one hand, we can talk about, well, there's only two toilets, you know, the, the men's room and then the ladies' room. And yet at the same time, you have to be able to hold in your head that you have to account for uh, the other emerging genders, the other genders. And so, and yet, despite the the cognitive conflict or even the affective conflict that occurs, you're saying that it's a special gift to be able to hold all those thoughts and keep an open mind 
before saying something that could get you into trouble. <laughs> I like the last remark. <laughs> Oops, I can't erase it anymore. <laughs> and, and that says yes, but I would like to believe it's not a gift. I think it's something that you can actually learn. Okay. Personally, I think you can. Hmm. I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, the emotional intelligence background that I have is telling me it is difficult. Yes. But it is doable. Hmm. It's something that you really have to work on, but it requires really a lot of uh, control of your of your thoughts, if you want to say. And when I say this, because when I teach emotional intelligence, I don't say it's not managing your emotions. It's managing your reaction to your emotion. Because your emotion you'll have, period. Hmm. Even when you go out to buy something, there's always a small emotion. Oh, you get a little excited. <laughs> there is, always. It's true. Right? And, and you can't stop that. And you don't want to stop it because if it's a strong emotion, you bottle it up. Good luck. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so when it comes out, you say, okay, here's the emotion. What do I do with it? That's emotional intelligence. So you're managing your response to your emotion, not necessarily managing your emotions because you don't want to deny any of them. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so Paul, um, just following up on this line of thought, it, it is fascinating because, you know, some psychologists might say, if you have so many conflicting thoughts in your mind, uh, wouldn't that mean, say, something like uh, somebody who might end up suffering multiple personality disorder? <laughs> but on the other hand, a, a strong question is, is popping in my mind now to the effect that, who do you think is struggling with this more? Uh, those from, say, our generation or, or the more younger people? For me, it's not a generational issue. Okay. It isn't. And I'll just give you a point of view. I think you and I are boomers. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> okay. Uh, and... And admittedly, people have some preconceived notions about us. Agreed. Just like we have preconceived notions about the millennials and the Gen Z, is it now? Yeah. Gen Z. Uh, those, those will always be there, regardless. Hmm. I can assure you, when they see me walking down the street, they say, oh, look at that old guy. <laughs> I'm old, yeah. but maybe they haven't spoken to me yet. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> right. True. So that's going to happen. Uh, let's go back a little bit. I think in psychology, it's called cognitive dissonance. Yes. Yes. And I think all of us live with it to a certain degree. Some of us don't, but I think a number of us do. For example, I know I have to lose weight. Mm. I know that eating this kind of food is not good for me. But yet yeah. I say, oh, that looks delicious, and I eat it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's a form of cognitive dissonance. It's very mild. It's not going to drive me crazy. Mm. All right? Uh, but it can get really bad and lead to the situations you were explaining. But in that case, please, please, please go to an expert. I'm yeah. not that expert. Go to an expert. That's what they're there for. But in essence, it's that, but it's not in a destructive way. Mm. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example, and maybe this will also relate to the following talk about work from home. I mean, I wrote an article on LinkedIn about this, and I said, and it was about values, mission, vision, and values. And I said, and what I proposed was companies today are struggling simply because the mission and vision and values have shifted. Hmm. As a trainer, I used to train, align your mission and vision, your personal mission and vision with that of the organization, and it's fine. That seemed to make sense. But now when it comes from work from home, the organization has to align with the mission and vision of the person at home. Hmm. And I don't think organizations are comfortable with that. <laughs> so that's what's a, it's a little tricky. They have to learn how to help the person operate correctly at home. And that's based on his schedule, not mm. their schedule. That's right. based on his mission at home, not their mission. So it was a little tricky. And this is a good example of cognitive dissonance. Mm. Okay. Uh, oh, not sorry, cognitive dissonance. Intellectual inclusion. Let's make it a nicer look. Mm. Recently, with the COVID or the pandemic lifting, some companies were demanding that their employees go back to work. Right. They were, they were saying they'd come to work two or three times a day. You know, if it's something that's necessary, understand. If you're in a restaurant, you need the person to come to work. That's, that's understood. Mm. But let's say we're talking about work where you can do through Zoom like this. Yes. or just through, through. Let's talk about that kind of work. And mm. I said, you know, 
here's a challenge. The company wants the person to come home. But if you look at the person, first of all, my goodness, the prices of everything have gone up. Yes. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Even when COVID just started, commuting from point A to B became more expensive simply because you have to take a taxi, hire a car, you couldn't take the bus, whatever reason it was, it became more expensive. Mm-hmm. That was one thing. Second, it costs more to commute. It does. Especially if you want to stop and buy food. Mm-hmm. Third, I don't know if a company realized how much time is lost in commuting. Oh, yeah. It's an incredible amount of time. I was losing about up to, if I count even the time waiting for work to start because I got to the place early, I was <laughs> yes. up to seven hours a day wow. just in commuting. And I said, my goodness, that's a whole sleeping shift for me. Hmm. And then they tell the person that's come to work when he was working successfully at home before. Hmm. I said, something doesn't add up here. Yes. Okay, so there's something that isn't right. Now, in the company's thinking, I'm sure that they're saying, hey, you know, I'm the guy paying the bills. Well, you should come and see me. Fine. Hmm. But can you, in mentally, intellectually, can you hold the fact that he's also going through that? Can you hold them together at the same time and say, okay, let's do this instead? Mm-hmm. Or call up, Adino, I noticed, you know, we want to go back to work. What do you think about coming to work and working from home? Ask mm-hmm. them. I've never heard an interview about somebody working from home, whether he wants to go to work or not. Mm-hmm. None. It's all the management saying, oh, we should do this. That's great, but please. If you want to be intellectually inclusive, you have to hold even the other guy's thoughts in mind right. together. Mm-hmm. And maybe you can come up with a better solution. You know, I, I, I'd like to, sorry for interrupting. I, I'd like to pursue uh, a similar line of thinking because you brought up a, a very important point about um, being open to letting people simply work from home because, you know, if it's not really necessary for them to travel, because of all the cost involved. Um, another thought just entered my mind in that I was wondering, in terms of building capacities, in terms of being a leader, um, how critical is it to have good communication skills? Because sometimes one of the reasons why people insist on making their talents come to the office is this sense of control of of being able to manage those who are physically present so uh how would how would the communication still be relevant especially now that we're in a digital world i'll look at that from two points of view actually the first uh, comment i'll make really isn't communication but it speaks to the fact that you know you want people to come to the office yeah and my personal pet peeve about that, because I've been a, I've been a leader where 200 people report to me, okay? <laughs> I said, come on, if you're a leader in an office, you walk in, everybody says hi to you, the guard is nice to you, the receptionist gives you a nice smile, somebody offers to make you a cup of coffee, <laughs> somebody will about drop, drop by and say hi to you in your office. They all like that, correct? When you go to an empty office, how do you feel? Mm. You'll say, where is everybody? Quick, call them in, I want to talk to them. <laughs> Okay, come on. That's <laughs> just on a personal thing. But coming back, coming back to communication. Uh, and when I talk about communication, I've come to the point that since communication is difficult, excellent communication is difficult, I'm always from the point of view that I will most likely miscommunicate first rather than communicate well. Mm. Okay, that's how, that's how difficult I, when I look at it and study it, I said, you know, Good communication is difficult. So I'm from the position that I'll always miscommunicate first. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. That's the position I'm from. When it comes to the digital communication, uh, admittedly, when COVID struck, the technology was, I would call it half-baked. It was there, but it wasn't there. Oh, yeah. Okay, things like Zoom fatigue started showing up and all this, blah, 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 blah. But I think that technology will also fix it a little bit because it's also getting better. Yes. But the whole concept of communicating like this all the time, mm-hmm. you'll have to work with different communication models, mm-hmm. if you want to say. Mm-hmm. Although the process is still there, the communication process is still there, what will happen is between points A and B, the methodology will change. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yes, it will change it, but on the other hand, I think it was, it's something that will become a necessity, something you have to learn. Hmm. 
one of the bigger challenges in leadership is I'll show you a wheel or a line. So these are all the competencies you have to be learned, you have to learn. And unfortunately, you cannot be weak in any. You have to be good to a certain level in all of them. So if communication is your problem, especially communicating like this, you have to learn how to communicate better. Currently, there's a quite a wealth of information how to do it correctly yeah. on, uh, online. But like all disciplines, if you want to say, you just have to do it, practice it, get comfortable with it. Uh, I thought as well that many people are likely to ask is that uh, in terms of communications, do, do extroverts have it uh, over the introverts in terms of uh, quality or ability to lead? Uh, is personality a big factor when it comes to becoming a great leader? No. Thank you. Thank let, you. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's wait. Let, let's qualify that a little bit. When it comes okay. to introvert and extrovert, that's not a measure of ability to be. Yeah. It's a descriptor of, of your personality. Hmm. It's like if I had a car and I wanted to go from point A to B, and you and I both had, let's say, a Toyota Corolla, okay? Yours is red and mine is white, but there's still cars that'll get me to point A and B. The only advice, because I'm an extrovert and I know this, the only advice I give, I have to tell extroverts is your propensity to speak is a disease. <laughs> and it's not. <laughs> At least the introverts more thoughtful. They'll think before they open their mouth. Right. We just keep on talking because right? we have to. All right? But, you know, I come from a training outfit and two of our best trainers were introverts. Mm. The only advantage I saw as an extrovert was once I saw a crowd, my energy levels went through the roof. Mm. And that's, that's real extrovert. True. When I speak to my introvert, introvert uh, colleague, she says, you know, standing in front of a crowd, when I take my lunch break, I have to hide in a corner. I said, <laughs> uh, that's fine. Me, I still go around and talk to everybody. <laughs> okay. But that's me because that's, that's the extra. But it, it has nothing to do with your capacity to lead, even your capacity to sell. Mm. It's got nothing to do with it. It's just a personality thing. It's like your car is red, my car is white. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> I, I love the way that you express that because in a recent conversation with Professor Rene Domingo, he, he did tell me that uh, extroversion or the ability to communicate is overrated. He, he, he mentioned that, um, look at Bonifacio. He was nowhere near as eloquent as, say, Aguinaldo. And yet, they saw him as a threat. You know, because he, he was such a, a great leader in terms of inspiring people, even if he wasn't particularly eloquent. So thank you uh, for, for validating that, that unique insight, that communication per se does not guarantee a great leader. Actually, just to add one more there, you have to keep in mind that an introvert, introvert chooses to speak. Hmm. An extrovert, he, he can't stop himself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that, that reminds me of my mom. But <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So, so Paul, um, in terms of how you are able to communicate these insights with people, um, what would what what are some of your ways by which you can be reached and contacted by people who might want to engage you so you can pass on more of your wisdom uh, how do they how do they find you well believe it or not despite my age i have a facebook page <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, oh no that, that page has the picture of my wife and i okay so, my family so at least i have hair there why because in my linkedin profile i also have one there my profile picture i'm bald and that was what i call my cape my covid hairdo but i shaved my head because i said i'll never see the barber anyway <laughs> oh. but i'll change mine i'll change it soon since i got a new picture also hmm. but you can either reach me to facebook linkedin or you can always email me okay hello 1964 yes that's the year i was born at gmail.com Oh, uh, we didn't quite hear the first part. Uh, there was a, a, a little echo. Could you could you share that again? That's Paul Angelo nineteen sixty four at gmail dot com. So, Paul, uh, I understand you have uh, another key concept to share. Okay, so so far I've mentioned 
can you distinguish fact from fiction? Mm. I've distinguished, I've also mentioned, do you have intellectual inclusion? Mm. And the third one, and I think many of us can relate to this, especially when we look at our boss, yeah. do you have the capacity to think you're wrong? Now, I'm not saying admit you're wrong, that's easy. You could say, I'm sorry, but do you have the capacity to think you're wrong? Mm. Some examples that I can share are really, you know, way out there. For example, I was working with an organization whose business was impacted by COVID, mm. severely impacted by COVID. And I was just listening to the discussion. And, you know, if you look at the situation then at the beginning, if you look at it then, a couple of things. One, you knew that COVID was going to end. That you knew if you wanted to be an optimist. But you didn't know when. You had no idea. Two, the old business model that you were operating obviously doesn't function. Yeah. So you had to switch to a new one. That was the option. Now, as a leader, maybe the leader was you know, a little too stubborn or something. He insisted on waiting because he was convinced that the model he was operating was still the best one. Mm. And I was sitting there thinking, I said, you know, I like that. But you have to understand, you have no idea when that will be zero. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay, so that's the fact. And I go, so what? Are you going to continue waiting for something that you have no idea what's going to happen? Don't you think it's smart to at least prepare for the other option? Mm. Or, you know, at least get yourself ready to go? Nothing. Mm. Absolutely nothing. And I looked at it, I said, this guy's, I, I, maybe mentally he couldn't admit he was wrong and what he was thinking. Mm -hmm. simply because his business model was very, very successful. Mm -hmm. Which, again, I said, that's fine, but look at the situation now. Mm -hmm. You know, again, this can, be, this can be expressed in so many different ways. I mean, some of us, we look at our boss, we say, this guy can never admit he's wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, but more interesting is, how about you? Maybe you're the one who's thinking incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'll give you a very simple example. Email exchange that actually happened. I had a client at Cebu. Never met him, just on the phone and through email. We agreed on a contract. So we finally sent over an email that said, oh, thank you, Mr. Lazo. You know, we're all excited for you, to have you here. Can you please send me your itinerary? Mm -hmm. So I did. Dear Mr. Client, I'll be leaving Manila at 1.30 p.m. I should be arriving in Cebu at 3, uh, 3 p.m. This is, uh, and I'll be staying in this place. Please have transportation ready for me. Send. Mm. Five, seven minutes later, he responds. Thank you for your prompt response, Mr. Lasso. What is your itinerary? And I typically ask, how would you respond to that? Ah. <laughs> it, it took okay. me 15 minutes to answer, I told you. Mm. It took me 15 minutes to answer. Why? because it took me 15 minutes to realize that maybe the way I wrote the email, he could not understand. Mm. So I took out an Excel, white, black heading, <laughs> little cells, Mr. Lazo's itinerary, flight number, I put the whole thing. Mm. I even started a new email trail, not to embarrass him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Here, Mr. Client, uh, please forgive the, the, the crosswires. Here's my itinerary. Sam, and it comes back, thank you, Mr. Lazo. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, it, it's a small thing, but you can see these maybe impediments or these opportunities for mm. these thinking capacities mm. to improve your, your ability to lead, and it will mm. definitely impact the competencies. You'll be able to coach better. You'll be able to empower better. Mm. You'll be able to do all of those, definitely in a higher level. True. Uh, often it's been described that communication is not really communicating to be understood, but to avoid being misunderstood. Um, and, and that's a, a very good point that you made just there. Because sometimes we, we are better speakers than we are writers. And, and so when we, when we read something and we take it too literally without being willing to question what it might really mean, then we end up doing the wrong thing. Hmm. Right. And maybe not the best thing. There's a more positive way to approach it. Maybe it's yeah. not exactly the wrong thing, but maybe not the best thing. Hmm. You know, just, uh, just as a side topic, um, I realize that there are leaders who are reluctant leaders, and then there are leaders who want to be leaders. Um, who would you tend to 
to be wary of? I'll put out, I'll put out a little quote from my quote bag. Okay. <laughs> I think we all know Sir Francis Bacon. Yes, we do. I mean, maybe we do. I don't know about the younger group. But he said something very nice. Something I really, really maybe say, you know, it took, it grabbed my attention. And he said, when you start with doubt, you end with certainty. When you start with certainty, you end with doubt. Mm. So I'd be more wary of the guy who's absolutely sure. Okay, because most chances, most likely he's going to fall into a, 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 a decline or an issue. Mm -hmm. And that's where his doubts start happening. Now, of course, we can coach to get out of that. That's there. But at the same time, you know, maybe he won't pull out of it. I don't know. Rather yeah. than the man's doubting, and I build him up so he feels sure of what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that thought. So, uh, Paul, what kind of advice would you like to give, you know, young people, especially those who are Gen Zers who are just now starting their careers as far as building their capacity to become great leaders someday? Straight out, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> uh, why do I say this? Uh, people are debating whether leadership leaders are born or made. Hmm. And I can completely understand the arguments of leaders are made. Because yes, I can put you through a school, you can become a good leader, so forth and so on. But personally, for me, leadership at the end of the day is a decision. And why you choose to be a leader, that's inborn. Mm. Why did I choose this path? I don't know, because it looks cool. <laughs> I'm not saying that just because you chose to be a leader because you want the title and the money, which comes with it usually, that you will decide to become a leader. Because I know people who've chosen to become managers and don't want to lead. Mm. They're good managers, but they don't want to lead. So internally, they haven't, they haven't uh, decided to be a leader yet. Mm. And why do I say be careful what you wish for? I still remember when the millennial issue was a big thing. They were writing how to deal with millennials, so forth and so on. Then I read an article, I think it was in Forbes, and they said that now that millennials are managers, they don't like it. Oh, oh now you understand why your boss is sounding so horrible <laughs> and he's making horrible decisions. Because you've never been there. Mm. Okay, believe it or not, in leadership, when you give out an assignment, you know that that person will make a mistake. Mm. You know you will. It's an expectation. Mm. Worse yet, you will be held accountable for that mistake. Mm. And when I train, when I talk about accountability, I use a very simple example. I said, look, my 16-year-old daughter takes my car and crashes it into a tree. I said, who's responsible? Ah. Who's responsible? I'll ask them, most of them will say me. I said, no, I'm not. She is. But who's going to pay for it? I will. I'm accountable. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and in its worst form, please. I mean, the, I, I reached the point for other people's stupidity. <laughs> Just to realize that I was the one being stupid. Okay, not them. But, you know, it's, leadership is a very selfless act. Mm. It is. And uh, when you decide to become one, and I'm not saying that just because you decided to go to the supervisory courses to the leadership academy of your organization, you've decided to become a leader. Mm -hmm. Tell me, after you're being blamed for everything, everyone is blaming you for everything, and tell me whether you want to be a leader or not. Ah, yes. Okay, because that's it. Come on. You've been through this. If there are any managers in this group, I'll ask you, how many of you feel like the whole world hates you? <laughs> if you're comfortable with that then let's be a leader yeah <laughs> <laughs> so when you reach that point and you're deciding to do it then okay maybe you really are but again it boils down to that decision to become a leader for me that's a that's an inborn thing it's not it's not it's not something you learn mm. okay it, it's something that you that something in you just tells me i'll do this yeah okay, so. that is very good advice because someday our listeners, our young listeners, will end up sitting behind the desk and right. mediating conflicts that will create unpopular <laughs> decisions. Yes. Or uh, someday they'll sit behind a CBA negotiation table okay. and they're going to end up with very dirty looks from people when they leave the room. <laughs> and yet... Uh, one more thing there. Yeah. Uh, 
and I'll relate this also to, to being married because I've been married for more than 30 years. Okay. A lot of young people come up to me and say, sir, what advice do you have? <laughs> and, I joke, and I jokingly tell them, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I tell them, you said, you know, I can give you all the advice you want, mm. but at the end of the, end of the day, you have to live it. Yes. Period. And, it, you know, leadership is the same. You actually have to live it, go through it, and tell me, do you want to do this, yes or no? Because it is, it is really, it's, it's, it's unique, I would say. Mm. And the simple fact that there are very few excellent leaders, for me, is an indicator that proves the point. Hmm. That's true. So, um, on behalf of the Leaders Edge team of hosts, we'd like to thank you, Paul, for sharing your valuable time and expertise with us. And perhaps in the future, uh, we in the Speakers Bureau can call upon you to uh, help some of our clients. Uh, we could probably tap you as one of our talents. So um, as ever, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please stay tuned because on episode 11, we will be having Rosario Kahukom Bradbury, who will be talking about the future of workplace. Now, that is such a beautiful topic because it merges well with Paul's topic today. So if you want to become a great leader in the future workplace, do stay tuned for that. And if you like this episode, do click on like, share, and subscribe to get notified. And as ever, remember that learning is a never-ending journey with limitless vistas. Good day.